that they talk about all the time, only brought the world to an end between the Germans and the victorious powers. Remember, in the last class, I said the war was fought between the Allied forces and the Central Powers, or Triple Entente and Triple Alliance. Now, Germany was the main aggressor. That was why we concentrated on that of uh, Versailles. Germany was the main aggressor. That was why we concentrated on that peace treaty of Versailles. The treaty was signed in 1919, and it only brought one in, one face of that war. So there are about four other aggressors apart from Germany. So what the victorious powers now did was to sign individual peace treaties with them. That five peace treaty, the major one you are aware of is that of Versailles, and that Versailles is just one. So Versailles is between Germany and the victorious power. Then the Treaty of uh, Saint Germain was signed between the victorious powers and Austria. Saint Germain was signed between the victorious powers and Austria. Then Trianon was signed between victorious power and Hungary. Newly was signed between the victorious powers and Bulgaria. Then Sirius was signed between the victorious powers and this treaty was used to bring the First World War to an end. So you have the Versailles, Derby and the superpowers and the victorious powers. And when I say Germany and the victorious powers, I'm basically referring to Britain, France, and the United States. So you have Versailles, two, you have Saint Germain, that's the Austria and the victorious power. Remember, Austro Hungarian Empire. So that was why they were picking them one after the other. Then you have Trianon, the victorious power, and Hungary. The fourth one, newly, between the Bulgaria and the victorious powers. Then finally, you have in 1920, Peace Treaty of Severs, S E V R E S. In 1920, that would have been the end of the First World War. Now, that severus was signed with the victorious powers and the Ottoman Empire. Then there was no talk. It was known as the Ottoman. But the Turks rejected that treaty in 1920. So they fought Greece and other powers in 1923. So it was in 1923 that they signed the Peace Treaty of Lugzain. And that brought the First World War to an end in 1923, not 1920. They signed that peace treaty in 1920. The Ottoman Empire rejected that treaty that was signed in 1920. So they fought those guys that imposed the treaty on them, especially Greece. And they were forced to sign a new treaty with the Ottoman Empire called the Treaty of Luxembourg in 1923. And that brought the First World War to an end. Again, every war usually comes to an end at the end of signing of the treaty. If there is no treaty, then the war has not ended. That is why they said the Second World War is still on till today. Because there has been no agreement signed between North Korea, aggressor back then, and the victorious power till today. So technically, they said the Second World War is still on. Right? That is why North Korea is very, very aggressive till now. But First World War came to an end officially from 1919 that, and terminated in 1923 with the signing of the peace treaty. What are the terms of this peace treaty? What people will tell you is that the seed for the Second World War was sown in that peace treaty of the First World War. That the remote factor response for the Second World War was located in that peace treaty itself. Nigeria fought a civil war in 1967. By 1970, that war came to an end. You know what Nigeria was saying? No victor, no vanquished. There was a reason why. You know, they were, you say, when, when you are victorious, be careful. Don't rub it in. When you rub it in, it can create a feeling of resentment and of a truth. The reasons for the Second World War, part of it can be located in that peace treaty. How you celebrate when you win a war matters. How you celebrate when you win a war matters. That stuff is key. So how you celebrate when you win a war matters. Now, you don't celebrate to the extent of creating resentment on the people you've defeated. Because when you create resentment in them, then they'll be looking for what they call revenge. So that means you get part two of that conflict. I don't even understand what I'm trying to say. So how you celebrate at the end of every war, that was why Nigeria was smart enough to say, no victor, no, but even despite that, we are still facing problems with that thing. Despite the fact we didn't actually celebrate. But in the case of the First World War, the French and the British, they celebrated. In fact, their favorite song was Hang the Kaiser. That's Hang the German Emperor. Squeeze them. Take everything from them. Take them back to the Stone Age. Make them poor. In fact, part, part of the times of the Peace Treaty, and I'm not making this up, was this, that the Germans would pay all the orphans in both Britain and France, and the widows whose husband died during that war, that the German would pay them every family in Britain and every family in France. Once your husband died in that war, it is the Germans that will take care of your family in Britain and in France. And all the orphans, down to their education, down to their family, everything was put on the German. Not only that, they forced the German to be working in their own country for the British and the French economy. Everything that they were manufacturing in Germany were taken back to Britain and to France. Of course, now it made sense for that to create feelings of resentment in the German Hitler in 1939. That started the Second World War. In terms of the treaty, one, for Versailles. German territories were taken away from it. German territories were taken away from it. German territories, both within Europe and countries were taken away from 
importantly, and you should know this, Alsace Lorraine was taken from Germany and given back to France. So Second World War, Germany started that war to take back that territory from France and back to Germany. Alsace Lorraine was taken from uh, Germany and given to France. Importantly, German territories were taken and given to Poland and Poland took it. <laughs> you know, there, there are some gifts you reject. <laughs> German territories, Danzig, was taken from Germany and given to Poland. So it was no surprise in 1939 that it was from Poland that Germany started that madness, that Second World War. German territories were taken from uh, 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 were taken and given to Poland, which is not a crime. The crime was that Poland accepted that gift. So it was so bad. This was what they did to Germany. Poland is landlocked. There was no Poland before the First World War. So when the war came to an end, they now wanted to create a territory for Poland. Now, Poland is landlocked. When I say landlocked, that means it has no access to water. You know what they now did? They divided Germany into two and created an expressway for Poland to the sea. And Poland took that land from, from Germany. Uh, that was why in 39 now, Hitler said, I'll destroy Poland. Whatever you do, whatever anybody says, if you know you want to die with Poland, join them. And she invaded Poland and destroyed Poland aggressively. In fact, when we were talking about negotiating with people that de uh, defeated, Hitler said, I'm not interested in talking to, I want to wipe Poland off the face of the earth. Forget about them. They're not even people we should negotiate with. But she was angry because Poland now said, but we were given, and he said, you accepted. <laughs> you took, you're not even scared, but you took it. <laughs> And you enslaved my people on my own territory. That was two. Three. Outside now, France and Britain shared German territories in Africa. They're in the Middle East. So France and Britain explains why in some part of Togo they speak German. In some part of Cameroon they speak German. But initially, those regions actually belong to Germany. So German lost territories. Uh, that's according to the Peace Treaty of Versailles. Then four, Jam said that Germany can only have a troop of less than 100,000. And they can only serve for 12 years, 100,000. You cannot invade another country with such troops. They were trying to check the German from become, be, becoming the aggressor to threaten Europe again. So they were trying to stop the German from being able to threaten Europe. And if you believe that thing, the Germans were forced to pay reparation. They were forced to pay reparation for that war. So they were forced to pay in today's time, that thing will be about, will be about 545 billion dollars. And we are talking of 1920 back then. The French and the German wanted them to pay, I mean, and the British uh, wanted them to pay for that in perpetuity forever. I mean, isn't it when you do, you are failed, you have enough food in your stomach, that you don't have any problem, any worries, that you don't think of invading other countries. But then when you are busy paying off debt. Now, the treaty that was signed between Hungary and the victorious powers led to the dismemberment. Of that empire that was why there was there is nothing called it to the austro-hungarian empire that treaty led to the dismemberment of the australia austro-hungarian empire one importantly it separated the two countries that is why you have them independent till today austria then you have hungary so it separated the two countries two all those territories under the austro-hungarian empires were given their independence all those countries under the austro-hungarian empire were given their independence. It's the same with that of uh, Turkey. That was when the Ottoman Empire stopped being the Ottoman Empire and it became Turkey till today. Yes. All the territories under it had their independence too. They were given their independence. In fact, Russia too was dismembered as a result of that war. That was what led to the creation of those uh, okay, three, three Baltic states. Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia. Then on top of them you have Finland. All of them came into existence at the end of that war in Europe. In 19, uh, in uh, 1919, 1920 was when they started signing. I mean, 1919 was when they started signing all these their treaties. That was why I said 1919. But it came to an effective end by 1923 with the signing of the Peace Treaty of Siva. See, Ottoman Empire was lucky. Some part of it is in Europe and some part of it is in Asia together. You know, that's why you can't place them till today. They are sometimes in Europe. You know, Ottoman Empire is a Muslim country and they've been trying to become a member of the European Union. They've not succeeded because of one thing. The Europeans will never tell them that. But because, because they are not a Christian state. European unions are Christian states. The Turks wanted to be part of that European Union. And since 1980, they've been giving it conditionality still now. But they didn't just want to tell them that you guys are Muslims. We are Christians, so you can't join us. But they were unfortunate or rather they were unlucky in Europe because Ottoman Empire straddles two continents both Asia and Europe together. I will only give you the background to why it straddles two continents now because of that first uh, world war. It was part of the agreement that all territories, all former territories of the Ottoman Empire should be given their independence. So when they did that thing, Empire, Adrianople, if I remember, Crete, she took them. So that was why those guys rejected that uh, treaty, Severus, in 1920 and said, no, 
You cannot push up just back to Asia. Huh? We have a European heritage. So they fought talk, uh, uh, Greece and pushed back into Europe with the peace treaty of uh, Luxembourg, and they were able to enter and stay within Europe till today. So that's why when you go to talk, it's both Oriental and European at the same time. They said the peace treaty of Versailles was based on what they call uh, the 40. America emerged from that was the most powerful state, the most successful state. So she had to impose her will on other states. What has, uh, there should be free nav the navigation of ships on the high sea. There should be free navigation of sheets on the high sea. Yeah, the water does not belong to anybody, it belongs to everybody. Just to avoid war. They discover that thing created problem. This is my area, that is your area. You cannot trade there, you cannot trade there. So, so free navigation of ships, international shipping on the high sea. Two, importantly, that diplomacy should be conducted in the open. <laughs> that it was secret diplomacy that started the Second World War and the First World War. Diplomacy should be conducted in the open. So that if you have any secret agreement with anybody before I fight, I would have been aware. I'm not only fighting, I'm also fighting that person. Remember now, triple alliance, triple entente. People thought it was just Austria that was being stubborn, not knowing that Germany was the one behind Austria pushing it. So people also thought that it was just France that was just being aggressive, not knowing that Russia too and America too were somewhere behind. So they said, keep that agreement open, terms and condition. When they invite you to join a secret society, if you are not a fool, you ask for the terms and condition. And they told you you are going to be rich, no problem. It's just rich you heard. But they didn't tell you you sacrifice your first son. Hey, but you are now rich now. You are now saying, but yeah, eh, everything should be I've been laid in the open. When you enter into last week, they give you their terms and condition. Remember, and you signed now, nothing to avoid war in that advertently, countries should be made to do their diplomacy. It was agreed that states that were under other European states, states that were under other European states, should be given their independence. States that were being colonized by those empires should be given their independence. So that led to the creation of different kinds of unbelievable states in Europe. Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, but they, they, all of they were all new states that were now created in Europe as a result of the peace treaty from that war. So quickly, League of Nations reason behind America's uh, refusal to join the League of Nations. America created the League of Nations with the 14 points. I mean, she gave birth to that thing. So what was the reason behind America's refusal to join the League of Nations? The peace is, uh, was actually dictated, not America. America, Britain, France were the one imposing the peace on Germany. And that was why you had the Second World War. They call it a diktat. It was created <laughs> to ensure peace among the Europeans. Though they say the world. Europeans were the world. <laughs> League of Nations was created to ensure peace among the Europeans. Though they will say it was created to maintain peace in the world. Now, it, has, it was meant to have five permanent members and five non-permanent members. And it... Japan was nominally a member of the League of Nations. <laughs> Interestingly, Japan left the League angrily because of America. So Pearl Harbor in 1939 and uh, 41 was not surprising. Japan had been harboring that hatred for America since the First World War. You know what Japan's, uh, Japanese annoyance member? Unfortunately, America refused to join, made that thing for. I said, made that thing for. And unfortunately, Japan also withdrew from that League of Nations, making it three. Finally, Italy also pulled out, making it just two. So it was just Britain and France that were the members of that League of Nations. They were the ones shaping affairs of the League of Nations. It was not surprising that the League of Nations eventually collapsed. From five, it became four. From four, three. Then from three, it became two. And interestingly, Japan that pulled out became an aggressor, invaded China. Italy that pulled out became an aggressor, invaded Ethiopia, Abyssinia. Then America were now withdrawn across the water that you're on your own, please, I'm tired. So it was just Britain and France. So it was not surprising that Germany was able to rise up later again to challenge the world. In fact, in fact, Britain even withdrew, leaving only France. And you know, it became a problem for France. France is the next door neighbor of Germany. So if Germany is going to start any war at all, it will start with France. So France was now doing like a prostitute all over Europe and the world, looking for allies. France begged America. America didn't listen to France. France appealed to Britain. Britain had already reached across what water separate Britain from the rest of Europe. So France now had to turn to, you know, like you said, they said they held their nostrils and turn to Russia, just come and sign. So that at least she will have that protection from Germany. After signing with Russia, she was now begging all these small, small boys. Even Poland, just come, sign, guy, let's defend ourselves together. All because of the fear of Germany. That was why they said the fear of the fear of Germany was the beginning of wisdom. And France was right. You know, she's been shouting since 1990 that look, if anything is going to happen, Germany is going to fight me first. And Germany number one's target. You know why? Because France took Alsace Lorraine. They gave it to her and she took it. <laughs>
and by 39, Hitler demanded back for that territory from them. You know why they call it a lightning war? Hitler was a madman. That guy took France within two weeks. Belgium, he just took them within some three, four days, just took all of them, just like that, and turned them to so Germany has some principal organs. You have the council, you have the council, you have the assembly of international justice. You have the council, I think those are the principal organs. Then you now have what they call a specialized organs or mandate territory. Specialized organs or mandate territories. But then you have the council, then you have the assembly, then you have the permanent court of uh, international justice. Council, five permanent members, executive, I mentioned their names already, minus America. They eventually became two. The assembly belongs to everybody. I think it was about some 49 countries that formed the League of Nations. Ethiopia was the only African country that was a member, a founding member of that uh, League of Nations. And unbelievably, the same Ethiopia was the country that Italy attacked in 1935. So I said, you have the assembly, everybody in the world belongs to that assembly. Then you have the PCIJ. Now, that court was the same power that the ICJ now has. You know, ICJ has declared Vladimir Putin a war criminal that should be arrested. But they don't have enforcement capability. They can only make pronouncements. They don't have the police force to enforce their decision. So that was the PCIJ then. It can only mediate in economic and other social matters, not political. Political is meant for counsel. Interesting question. Why did America refuse to join the PCIG? Permanent Court of International Justice. America didn't join now. In fact, when she wanted to join, she gave some set of conditionalities. Others, they said, America refused to join the PCIG. Why? In fact, it's the same way they refused to join the ICJ presently. They gave conditionalities now, and others now said, no, we don't want you. By 1939, the League of Nations failed. By 1939, the League of Nations failed. Now, the question you ask is, what were the factors responsible for the failure of that League of Nations? What were the factors responsible for the... One, of course, they say that thing, though I sometimes try to disagree. One, the refusal of the United States to join the League of Nations doomed it from the beginning. The refusal of the United States to, do, to join the League of Nations doomed that organization from the beginning. League of Nations was America's baby. They created it and they refused to join. And, you know, since America was the most powerful state in the world, the presence of America nation, two, two, aggress aggression of the member state of that League of Nations killed that organization. Aggression of the member state of that League of Nations killed that organization. The aggression of the member state actually killed. In fact, I think that's one of the most important factors that led to the death of that uh, League of Nations. Yes, Italy, Italy invaded Ethiopia. Italy invaded Ethiopia, another member, and they were part of the League of Nations. Then Japan invaded China. Then Russia threatened Finland. Then Italy invaded Greece. The aggression of the member state actually killed that League of Nations. You've forgotten that League of Nations does not have its, its own identity. It was created by states. So it can only succeed as an institution if states gave that thing the maximum support. But the state themselves were the one actually flouting the rules and regulations of that League of Nations. So the aggression of the states themselves killed the, that League of Nations. Three, the League of Nations did not outlaw warfare, unlike the UNO. The League did not outlaw warfare, unlike the UNO. The League allows you to kill your enemy after you've given them enough warning. You give them first six months warning, if it didn't work, give them three more months warning, that's nine months, then after that, you can go to war and destroy them. The League of Nations did not outlaw warfare, unlike the UNO, that banned warfare outright. So League of Nations only said you have to be fair when you're trying to destroy a state. Let them know you are coming to destroy that, that they offended you. So you allow the League of Nations to settle it for six months. If it didn't work, then you give the other state three months warning again. Then by the tenth month, 